Welcome back. Um, last lecture we talked about population uh, biology and so today we're going to increase the level of organization to uh, community ecology. So a community is uh, a group of interacting um, populations living in the same area. So um, all the communities that we have that are on land are going to exist because of uh, photosynthesis. So I just wanted to refresh your memory about photosynthesis in case it's something that's not uh, something that you remember too well. And uh, if you remember, pho photosynthesis is going to take place in autotrophs. It's going to take sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water. And in a very sophisticated process in a photosynthetic organism, the photosynthetic organism is going to produce glucose and uh, release oxygen as a waste product. So this is the equation down here for photosynthesis. But communities, that is, groups of interacting populations, are going to exist because of, of there being uh, organisms that uh, are going to provide food for that particular system to exist. Now, communities are really, really complicated. So um, we don't know much about communities. We don't know how they function. You know, it is an emergent, an emergent property when you get lots of populations living in the same area. These communities uh, develop, and, and again, they're very sophisticated uh, uh, entities. So before we talk about specific uh, relationships in uh, communities, I want to talk about the concept of a, of a niche. So every species that you find in um, nature is going to have a specialized life role. So if you look at the picture down here, I love going to the beach personally. And when I go to the beach, I always look at all these little organisms that, uh, these, that, that are um, living on the beach. You know, all of them are shaped a little bit differently. In this particular example, we're, we're looking at bird species. So we have ducks and we have flamingos and shorebirds. And you can see that every single species has a different sized uh, beak, a different length of beak, a different thickness of a beak, a different sized leg. And they exploit different elements of the, of the uh, habitat. So for example, these... Uh, these smaller shorebirds here, you know, they're going to run back and forth every time a wave crashes and they're going to be digging up small things that are on the surface. You know, if we get down here to something like this dowager, this is going to have a longer beak and can exploit a little bit different part of the shoreline. Oyster catchers have really thick beaks and they're able to actually break open mussels, clams, and oysters. And you know, the heron has a spear so it can spear fish. Um, you know, and then there are things like flamingos that can actually filter uh, particles out of the water. Of course, you're familiar with the pelican diving down and scooping up uh, large amounts of fish. You know, there are also things like scavenger types of birds, the, like, your, uh, like your seagull there. It'll scavenge. And uh, so every creature has its own little life role that it plays. And this concept of the niche is a little bit more complicated than just a specialized life role. But the niche is going to include the space and territory that the organism uses, its nutrition and feeding habits, interactions and relationships with other organisms, reproductive habits, um, its role and impact on the environment or the ecosystem. So when you think of the, this word niche, um, I don't want you to think of it as just a specialized life role, but I want you to think that it includes or encompasses all of these various elements of the organism. And, uh, you know, that's very complicated and very sophisticated, all of these things combined. So each creature is going to have all of these things that are going to be different from other creatures, or at least different enough where they can live in the same habitat and not compete too much with each other. When you get competition, things get really interesting. So in a community, you know, species are going to interact in many different kinds of ways. So um, I want to go through and talk to you about different um, relationships that organisms can have within a community. So one of the interesting one is, ones is interspecific competition. Inter means between, so between species, competition between species. So when members of two or more species interact to gain access to the same or limited resources, such as food, light, and space, this is what we call interspecific competition. And down here you can see the lion is competing with this, uh, with this group of hyenas. So interspecific competition. Now, when things begin to compete with each other, there has been several scientific studies that have, that have looked into this. 
Um, one of the principles that has been developed from studying interspecific competition is called the competitive exclusion principle. And this principle basically states that when two or more species live in the same place and use the same resources, one is usually forced to move or go extinct. And uh, we have several examples of research studies that have been done to, to show that, uh, that this principle actually exists. This is one of the more famous experiments that has been done before. And uh, so we have two species of barnacles here. We'll call this one the brown barnacle and this one the blue barnacle. You can see up here the genus name of each of those. Um, and uh, so one scientist thought to themselves, you know, why in the world is there a separation line there? I wonder if, you know, the scientist said to himself, uh, I wonder if uh, this brown barnacle would love to live a little bit further down. Why is it just in this particular location right here? So, um, so what the scientist did is he actually went out and he removed all of the blue barnacles. So he took a, 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 a chisel and a hammer and basically knocked off all these, uh, these blue barnacles. And what he discovered was that the fundamental niche, that is the brown bar barnacle, would love to live all the way from the high tide line to the low tide line. Um, and if you remove competition, it actually does that. And that's called its fundamental niche. This is fundamentally where it would love to live if, not the, if the competition was not there. But unfortunately for the brown barnacle, this blue barnacle is, going, is uh, competing with it. And so the realized niche, that is the niche that it has to live in because of competition, is the space from where the blue barnacle uh, stops living to the high tide line. Okay, so the uh, reverse experiment was done. So the brown barnacle was uh, removed, and uh, so the brown barnacle was removed. And what the scientists discovered was that the the blue barnacle would not move any further to the high tide line. So the blue barnacle, its fundamental niche where it wants to live is exactly where it's living, and its realized niche happens to be the same thing as its fundamental niche. So this is like a super competitor here. It just doesn't have the ability to live higher on the high tide line. It doesn't have the ability to, to outcompete the brown barnacle up here. So when you study all the different species that are in the world, and, uh, and you begin to see where they, uh, where they are competing with each other, then these principles of fundamental and realized niche take, in, take place so that these things, you know, um, basically don't compete with each other to the point where, where, um, where you know, th they can't live at all. So it appears that the brown barnacle has moved. It's been forced to move. And if, the, if this blue barnacle evolves the ability to live higher up and the brown barnacle can't compete with it, then maybe it'll go extinct altogether. Okay, so that's the concept of the fundamental and realized niche. Um, Gauss uh, did an experiment with uh, using paramecium. He used two different species of paramecium, paramecium aurelia and par paramecium caudatum. And uh, what he basically did was he grew um, these, uh, these species separately. So in this particular upper graph here, he grew uh, paramecium uh, aurelia uh, um, separately from uh, a, mix, uh, a mixture of uh, caudatum and aurelia. And he found that... Uh, you know, separately, Aurelia does really well. In a mixed population, it doesn't do too bad either. So its population is reduced down somewhat. If you look at the graph, it's reduced down somewhat in, in, in number. Um, and he did a separate experiment with Caudatum. Separately, Caudatum does really well. You can see its population density is pretty high. But in a mixed population, it significantly drops. It doesn't have the ability to compete as well as Aurelia does. Okay, so it's basically, its fun, fundamental niche is reduced significantly, and its realized niche is very, very small in uh, comparison. So we have some experimental evidence. It's not overwhelming, you know, um, every organism on it has been studied yet, but, um, but these are several different studies that have been done. One last study to show this concept of what happens when uh, creatures are together and when they're separated uh, is, uh, is done with uh, planaria here. Here we have two different color planaria, a yellow and a blue, just in this graphical example. And we call this one A and this one B. And uh, if, you could, if you could look here, planaria A, if grown separately, you know, it does uh, pretty well. And this is a temperature gradient here. So this x-axis is temperature. So you can see that it likes to live in temperatures in between, you know, something like 7 
uh, degrees Celsius and uh, something like 17 degrees Celsius. Planaria B, when it's grown, likes to live in 7 degrees Celsius and then up to 25-ish degrees Celsius. But when you grow them together, they basically will separate themselves so that uh, this is now the, uh, the, uh, the niche that uh, each of them is realizing in regards to their competitiveness at different temperatures. Now, why do species do this so they don't overcompete with each other? So this divergence allows for there to be very little competition where the resources are overlapped. Okay, so uh, again, if if they live but, but by themselves, their realized niche is much excuse me their fundamental niche is much greater. But when they are grown together, they begin to separate themselves out. Therefore, less competition occurs, and they can both exist together. Another thing that uh, happens is called character displacement when they have this interspecific competition. And uh, character displacement is a concept where when popul uh, populations are, um, are together, they are more divergent. And when they're allopatric or separated, they actually uh, are more closely related. So we'll use uh, Darwin's finches up here. So the x-axis is beaks uh, depth in millimeters. And this is the percentage of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the birds in different age classes. So um, if you look at, um, at grown separately, so we, here we have this Darwin finch fortis when it's grown separately. And then we have um, Fulganosa when it's grown separately. If you notice, they're very similar to each other in terms of the depths of their beaks. But when they're grown sympatrically, that is together, on the same island here where they're being grown on the same island Santa Maria in the Galapagos Islands uh, you can see that they have divergence in their in their characteristics why they, they they have to do this if they don't do this then you know the competition here would be too great thought somebody's going to go extinct or there won't be enough food available here they're able to exploit different food sources because different depths of beaks allow them to eat different uh, different hardnesses of uh, seeds and I guess my last example of interspecific competition is called resource partitioning. Here you can see in, uh, uh, this is a study done on the knolls in, um, in the Caribbean islands, but uh, resource partitioning is the evolution of species using similar resources to adapt to new resources. So we had a whole um, adaptive radiation of uh, anoles in the Caribbean islands. You know, you can't go anywhere and find more anoles than in the Caribbean islands. And so each of the different species exploits a different resource. So some of them live or spend, you know, 50% or greater of their time higher up, really high up. Uh, sometimes they're uh, very distinct on different parts of the tree. So you can see they have resource partitioning and utilize different resources to minimize the competition for those resources. And uh, one of my favorite studies is, is, is the MacArthur study. Uh, R.H. MacArthur did a study uh, when he w w uh, up in the forest in, um, in um, New England, and he studied warblers, and warblers are neotropical migrants. They go down to the Caribbean islands or central South America to live during the wintertime, and, uh, and then they come back during the uh, summertime to breed. And what he noticed is that there's all different kinds of warblers. You can see all the different species of warblers here. And uh, what he noticed by studying them is that uh, is that uh, each warbler uses 50% or more of its time to exploit the resources of a different area of these different trees, of the, of the same tree. So if you notice the Blackburnian warbler will use more of the periphery of the tree, whereas the yellow rumped warbler uses the bottom of the tree. Again, it's 50% or more of their time. It's not to say that they're not using other parts of the tree, but they try, I don't know, they don't try, but they just happen to exploit the resources. Here you can see that Cape May exploits the top of the tree. So this again is showing you resource partitioning. It exists because there's competition amongst, amongst these species. If there were no competition, the birds could exploit all the habitat 100% of the time. But because of competition, they seem to pick different areas to exploit of the uh, tree for food um, um, foraging. Competition is uh, is also uh, uh, in, in a form called intraspecific competition. This is competition between members of the same species. So that's not necessarily a community thing. It's more of a population thing. But I just th thought I'd throw in that root word intra means between. 
and this is competition between. You can see the foxes here are fighting for living space or mates or some kind of, uh, of resource. So what do you see going on here? Yeah, this is the relationship called predation. Predation is a predator-prey relationship. So you have in this example, the black racer is a snake there that's the predator. And uh, this leopard frog here is the prey species. So predator and prey relationship exist in a community. And uh, when you get a predator-prey relationship, you know, you get things like camouflage that develops and, and, uh, and also warning colors and poisons. So predation, you know, develops uh, through evolutionary time, develops all different kinds of cool shapes and colors and toxicities and poisons and venoms uh, that exist between predator and prey. Batesian mimicry is, uh, is something you can see within predation. So you have a harmless species, uh, such as here, this, uh, this uh, scarlet king snake, and, uh, and a harmful species, such as this coral. Um, you know, the, the mimic is the, is the thing that's not, uh, not uh, uh, um, harmful. Uh, and uh, so, um, so here you see the coral snake is the model, and then the scarlet king snake over here is the, is the mimic. And so it's smart to mimic something that's um, that's that's uh, that's uh, venomous uh, or poisonous. So you don't have to get eaten. So if you notice, the coral snake has yellow touching red. So if yellow touches red, you're a dead Fred. If black touches red, um, that would be the better example of something that's non-venomous. Now that works in the United States. It doesn't work in Central America. There are coral snakes that don't follow that particular thing. So uh, if black touches red, you're okay, Fred. If yellow touches red, you're a dead Fred. There's all different kinds of mnemonics that go with that. So here we have uh, a caterpillar that mimics a vine snake. So again, uh, that's a Batesian mimicry uh, principle. Cryptic coloration is camouflage. So camouflage develops uh, amongst prey and predator because of the predator-prey relationship. Um, we also have aposiomatic coloration. These are warning colors. And uh, so that is a warning color there that warns birds that, hey, I'm toxic because this yellow and, and black, they're high contrast colors. And this is a very toxic frog. So here we have an example of, a, of, a, um, of an insect that uh, is uh, this mimicking these, these sticks and these lichens here. So that happens to be a praying mantis. So this would be a warning color. This is a female black widow spider, and she uses uh, the red hourglass shape on the bottom of her abdomen as a warning color to, um, to predators. So this happens to be eye spots. This is more aposiomatic, so the eye spots there are going to look like an owl. And what's cool about this is that the moth doesn't even know it has eye spots. It can't see the eye spots on its back. It's just through evolutionary time, these, these spots and, and, uh, and, uh, and pigment uh, areas have developed. And uh, so I, I really like this because it looks just like an owl's eye. It's got the layers just like an owl's eye. It even has the little, um, the little white um, you can see this little white part here that looks like a, the glistening of light off of the cornea of the owl's eye. So, and uh, it, of course it can shut its wing and it can, it can uh, uh, blend in with leaves. So it has both camouflage and aposiomatic color uh, variations um, in one individual. Mullerian, uh, Mullerian mimicry is where two or more dangerous species mimic each other. So they each uh, are going to, uh, to um, reinforce the color. So if you look at uh, this, these, uh, these particular species here, both of them have yellow and black, and both of them have the ability to inject venom. So they're both venomous, and uh, these happen to be uh, bees mimicking bees. And uh, butterflies, uh, poisonous butterflies will mimic poisonous butterflies. We have that in Virginia, but we also have that a lot in uh, Central and South America. Um, this is one I just recently discovered. I don't even believe I put this in your notes, but this is one I re recently discovered. Uh, and this is in the Appalachian Mountains. You know, this uh, lecture is being given from Virginia. So I live near this, uh, this particular area here. And, uh, and uh, this was done by, um, by uh, Virginia Tech uh, scientists, uh, Paul Merrick and uh, James Bond. I mean, Jason Bond, excuse me, not 007. Um, 
and this was published in uh, the Proceedings for the National Academy of Science just recently. And uh, and I love this article because it talks about a malaric, uh, malarian mimicry uh, in uh, millipedes that I really enjoy. These are cyanogenic uh, millipedes. They produce cyanide. And uh, so up here we have um, aphelaria, and uh, down here we have uh, bractoria. Excuse me, uh, bractoria. So these are different genera of cyanide-producing millipedes. They're very, very dangerous. Both of them are very dangerous. The, the um, cyanide produced by one millipede here has the ability to kill a 300-gram uh, pigeon. So we're, we're talking about uh, very, very poisonous uh, creatures. And uh, what was kind of cool is that uh, Merrick and Bond, they went through the Appalachian Mountains and they basically found different regions that have... Um, these these cyanogenic millipedes and uh, a uh, filaria, uh you know it varies greatly uh, in the different regions that it exists so for example in in uh, region one this is what uh, this cyanide producing millipede looks like and uh, so we think that this one's the model and this one's the mimic but if you notice they basically have the same coloration so they are uh, they're, they're reinforcing to the local predators that particular color variation. So if you look at area four, you can see the millipedes, which are in different genera. Okay, these are different, um, different, uh, different species. Okay, they're completely different uh, uh, creatures. But you can see in the different regions they model each other almost perfectly. Okay, so in their coloration. But remember, they're very, very different creatures from one another. So um, so in terms of the different genera. But this is a cool uh, malarian mimicry um, that you can see in the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachian Mountains are incredible places for, for great diversity. And, uh, and uh, I wish to have more time to talk about the Appalachian Mountains, especially the salamanders are incredible that uh, they grow there. Well, plants, they also respond to predators as well and have their own unique uh, characteristics in, re in regards to responding to predators. And uh, they have structural characteristics like thorns and spines and hairs. These hairs can be quite irritating. If you uh, walk in the woods today um, where I live, you'll find stinging nettle. And uh, they have the ability to inject a little microdose of serotonin into you from little stinging hairs. And I'm sure you're also very familiar with uh, thorns and spines of cacti and blackberries and uh, things like that. There's also chemical uh, responses to predators, such as poisons. So, you know, morphine, strychnine, nicotine, tannic acids, all of these things uh, are poisons that are produced to, um, to disturb um, herbivores from eating uh, plants. Uh, even, uh, you know, caffeine and nicotine, um, you know, and uh, those kinds of things are uh, from plants. Uh, many plants produce phytoestrogens. These are estrogens that will uh, are almost like natural birth control pills to uh, diminish the, the reproductive output of um, of herbivores that uh, feed on plants. Well, in uh, in various uh, relationships and communities, you see sometimes cooperation, and in that example, you were seeing wolves cooperating together. Um, you can also see things like mutualism. And this example up here, it's a very famous example. We have the sea anemone, which is a venomous animal in and of, in and of itself. And then we have the, uh, the, the clownfish. And the clownfish will, uh, will swim in the tentacles of the sea anemone because it's immune to the venom of the sea anemone. And what it draws is it, dr it draws in prey fish that the sea anemone will actually eat. The sea anemone, sea anemone is not complete at digesting the food, so it releases you know, some of the particles of food which the clownfish will actually eat. The clownfish poops on the sea anemone, which feeds the algae, the dinoflag uh, excuse me, the zooxanthellae algae that exist inside of the tentacles. Um, so uh, this is a cool mutualistic relationship where both of them benefit from this relationship. Here you can see the acacia. The acacia is a plant. So you can see the leaves of the acacia here. At the end of the acacia plant, there are these little proteinaceous snacks that it feeds ants. Ants will actually feed on these snacks. Uh, they'll also, these stems are hollow and the ants can actually bore in through the, uh, and, and uh, form colonies inside the stem. So the ants keep uh, uh, anything that lands on the, on the acacia tree, it keeps it clean from insects and other vines and things for trying to grow up it. 
and the acacia plant provides a home for the insect and it provides food uh, for the uh, for the insect that's how you spell acacia if you're wondering acacia tree so you do not want to touch an acacia tree because these ants will boil out of it and will begin to sting uh, sting you with um, with their um, with their stingers this is parasitism so this happens to be a tick here and this is a human so we have a, uh, a parasite and a uh, host so this is the parasite and uh, this is the host and so this is a relationship that uh, is very common in uh, nature uh, we do have the parasite as the thing that consumes the tissue or blood and then we have the host which is going to be um, the organism being eaten or harmed so we have uh, endoparasites and we have ectoparasites endoparasites are going to be feeding on a host uh, inside of the host and ectoparasites feed on the external surface of the of the host so probably you've been a host at some point in time uh, maybe you have a tapeworm or some kind of fluke uh, maybe you've been eaten um, by a, uh, a, a tick or fed upon by a tick or uh, a mosquito so commensalism is an interesting relationship it's a relationship that exists where one organism such as this cattle egret is benefiting but the uh, other organism in this relationship is neither harmed nor helped so as an elephant walks through uh, you know many insects are um, are disturbed and they um, they basically try to get out of the way and the cattle egret will swoop down and eat it after it eats it it gets back on top of the elephant waiting for more prey to get out of the way um, humans are uh, also have commensalistic relationships you have many uh, organisms that live on the surface of your skin to eat dead skin we have mites that live on our eyelashes to eat dead skin they don't harm us they don't help us but they do benefit from us and that's called commensalism so we have many different bacteria and various creatures that live on the surface and perhaps inside of us as well that are commensals coevolution is uh, an evolutionary adaptation between uh, two interacting species so coevolution, probably the poster child example would be like a hummingbird and then a uh, a flower. Um, so the flower is uh, is tubular; it produces lots of nectar, and it's red. So it uh, is coevolved to attract hummingbirds to um, that particular um, in that particular relationship. All right, let me just talk about uh, a few other things that exist in a community. We have uh, the concept of uh, autotroph and heterotroph. Uh, you probably are familiar with that autotrophs feed themselves by uh, producing their own food. Heterotrophs are going to have to eat other living creatures. So another word for uh, that we can use for autotroph could be producer. It produces food from sunlight. And uh, another word we can use for autotroph would be consumer. There are many different kinds of consumers. So detritivores are interesting consumers. They are um, consumers that obtain organic nutrients from detritus. This is the cane animal and vegetable material and they use internal digestion so they have to consume the food actually eat it and ingest it and use digestive enzymes in its digestive system and then absorb the nutrients internally so that's a detritophore a saphotroph on the other hand is something like a fungus or a bacteria and it uses external digestion okay so so Saphotroph uses external digestion. A detritivore is an animal that uses internal digestion. So that's how we separate out those particular terms. Now an herbivore is going to be a plant eater. A carnivore is a meat eater. A scavenger is going to be feeding on dead material. And a parasite is uh, going to be feeding on uh, a host. Um, what do you consider yourself? Uh, do you consider yourself uh, an herbivore, carnivore, an omnivore that eats, uh, you know, uh, basically plant and animal material? I, I really consider myself a scavenger because when I go to feed on things, uh, really nothing I eat except for a salad is uh, is living. So all the food in my freezer is dead. It's been dead for a long period of time, and I eat canned vegetables and canned fruit. So, uh, so maybe humans are more like scavengers than they are other creatures. 
So let's just play a little game here. So uh, when I show you an image, think of it's a producer, a consumer, or a decomposer. So how about this fungi here? That's right, it's a decomposer. How about this gaboon viper? That's right, it's a carnivore. How about the antelope? That's right, it's an herbivore. How about the, the turkey vulture here? That's a scavenger. Squirrel? Well, a squirrel will eat anything. It's an omnivore scavenger. It's a, it's an ultimate creature. And that happens to be the eastern gray squirrel. Uh, on our campus at Patrick Kimry Community College, we actually have fox squirrels. How about this uh, pink lady slipper? Yeah, that's a producer. Musk, uh, musk oxen? That's an herbivore. How about lion? That's a pretty easy one. That's a carnivore. Leech? That's a parasite. And how about the hawk? That would be a carnivore. <clears throat> All right, well, let's go ahead and talk about roles that uh, organisms play in an ecosystem. So here you can see a panda and a raccoon. This helps us to understand the concept of a specialist species. It is a very, very, very narrow niche, so it eats bamboo exclusively, lives in bamboo forests. Um, so that would be an example of a specialist species, but some species are generalists, like the raccoon here. It has a very wide niche um, where it can live. It can live in woods, it can live in disturbed areas, urban areas, it can eat just about anything. Um, so it's what we call a generalist species. Now you might think to yourself, which is better, generalist or, uh, or specialist? Well, I guess it depends. You know, if there are plenty of bamboo forests and they're not uh, endangered of going extinct, then maybe it's good to be a specialist. But, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Generalist species are able to adapt to many different varieties of habitats. Here's the ultimate, ultra, ultimate uh, generalist species. This is a cockroach, and, uh, and it can live just about anywhere, as long as it's warm enough. So species can be considered native species. These are species that normally live in a particular ecosystem. So in my um, neck of the woods, uh, the white-tailed deer would be a native species. Non-native species are species that are introduced into um, a new ecosystem from another ecosystem. And in, in my neck of the woods here, we have red-eared sliders. These are turtles that have been introduced. And we also have carp and uh, and uh, and. Uh, kudzu, so there's many non-native species that live in our area. Indicator species are, are species that provide early warning systems to the damage to an ecosystem, so I'll share with you a couple of those in a second. Indicator species can also indicate things like fresh water, so if you see cattails, you know the water they're living in is fresh water. Keystone species are species whose roles, uh, who, who uh, have a, a role that plays uh, a very large effect um, uh, on the types and abundance of other species in an ecosystem. Uh, keystone species oftentimes build habitat, or they uh, they do things that uh, um, an ecosystem has to have, that service they have to have in order for that ecosystem to exist. And foundation species uh, play a major role in shaping communities by uh, creating uh, or enhancing habitats in a way that benefits other living species. So let me go through and show you some of these. So here we have an indicator species. This ha happens to be a trout. And uh, trout basically will indicate water quality and, uh, and thermal qualities of water. Trout have to have very cold water in order to live and uh, they have to have very clean water in order to live. So if a stream is too warm, you won't have trout. If a stream is uh, cool and, and uh, has really good water uh, quality, you will have trout. So it's an indicator species. Frogs are an indicator species too. You know, they live part of their time in the water as tadpoles, and then they live part of their life as, uh, as adult frogs on land. So they uh, basically will indicate uh, water and air pollution. Where water is really super polluted or land is really super polluted, you won't have frogs uh, living. So keystone species might be something like a bee. So there are uh, bees. You know, they do pollinate. You can see basically it has a pollen sac back there where it carries pollen and eats pollen. It carries pollen from one flower to the next on all the little hairs that are on the surface of its body. So without uh, bees, you know, many species of flowers would go extinct. Um, we do have a phenomenon um, where, uh, where we, we're seeing uh, colony collapse. 
Uh, some colony collapse is natural, but uh, colony collapse is also due to uh, us using pesticides to kill uh, pest insects. You know, pesticides don't discriminate. Some pesticides actually kill bees. Uh, you know, they'll kill anything that's a, an insect. So we have to be real careful with um, with uh, protecting our native pollinators and uh, and uh, reducing or minimizing the effect pesticides might have on them. So an alligator would be considered a keystone species as well. An alligator um, basically uh, takes and keeps uh, the whole ecosystem that lives in healthy. It weeds out sick and dying and diseased individual prey species, uh, thus keeping their populations healthy. We see also fruit bats are, are, are going to be keystone species because they spread by eating fruit. Um, from many different tropical plants. They poop the seeds out and the seeds grow in different areas, so they're definitely a keystone species. We know that wolves are keystone species too. They actually help the health of an ecosystem. If we don't have wolves in an ecosystem, then the prey population will explode, thus diminishing the, um, the uh, trees and vegetation. So, and uh, that can be a problem for the, for the, uh, for the herd um, going, um, uh, starving to death. Here we see the little dung beetle uh, rolling up a bowl of dung. A ball of dung. This is what it lays its eggs into and its larvae feed off of. Um, these are really important because they reduce or diminish the amount of waste products. Um, when uh, Australia first introduced cattle, the um, Australia doesn't have dung beetles. So when cattle, um, you know, basically uh, deposited its waste products everywhere, uh, it didn't decompose. So they actually had to introduce the dung beetle to Australia in order to, to decrease the amount of uh, waste products that were sitting around. So dung beetles are really important. They're uh, a keystone species. Foundation, foundation species would include uh, creatures like the beaver. So a beaver creates all this cool habitat here. It takes and dams a stream up. A stream has certain species that live in it, but a pond has different species that live in it. So when a beaver comes by and builds a dam, it actually floods an area and it, uh, it increases the, the, um, the biodiversity because different species can live in a pond that can't live in a stream. And this is the gopher tortoise. The gopher tortoise lives down in places like Florida. And what it does is it digs into the, sta the sandy area that it lives in. It digs these holes that you can see back here. And uh, other species of rodents and uh, other species like rodents and snakes and lizards will actually live in those and use those holes in addition to the gopher tortoise uh, using the hole itself. Okay, and I want to finish up with talking about trophic structure. So this is a concept that you're probably very familiar with. And uh, in an ecosystem, we do have um, things like food webs. So food webs exist. Um, but we try to understand food webs by understanding food chains. So food chains basically go like this. Producers produce food, consumers eat the food, and then decomposers decompose the, the uh, consumers and, uh, and the producers. Um, and you can see over here, this is more of a, a terrestrial food uh, uh, chain over here, and there's a marine food chain. In a terrestrial food chain, we start with a primary producer, such as a plant. We go to a primary consumer, such as an herbivore here, like a grasshopper. We go to a secondary consumer, which is, in this example, the carnivore, uh, this, this mouse here. And then we may have a tertiary consumer, which is the snake eating the mouse. And then a, uh, a quaternary uh, consumer, the, the uh, red-tailed hawk here eating the snake. Uh, now, you know a food chain doesn't exist because there are, are many things that mice and snakes eat, not just one particular thing. Over here in this marine food chain, we start with phytoplankton, we move to zooplankton. These are little microscopic animals that eat uh, the little phytoplankton, which is the things like algae. And uh, the phytoplankton are eaten by some kind of carnivorous fish. The carnivorous smaller fish are eaten by a larger carnivorous fish. And eventually we have an orca whale here uh, as a quaternary consumer. Again, food chains don't really exist. They, they, they are only examples of of um, of uh, of how uh, species are related to each other in an ecosystem, and it's just an easy way for us to kind of see the flow of energy through an ecosystem. Here's just a, a pond example. So here we have you know uh, producers uh, such as rooted plants and phytoplankton. They're being eaten by zooplankton. Zooplankton's being eaten by uh, these uh, these fish here, and then uh, the here the great white shark in a pond. The the uh, snapping turtle is eating the fish. 
Of course, there are, you know, fungi and bacteria that are decomposers that also are playing a role in this, uh, in this ecosystem. Now, food webs are really super complex. We actually don't know everything that eats everything, probably never will. So, but we try to do their best of understanding an ecosystem, and this is just a simplized version of this. Notice the way the arrows point. The arrows always point to the way the energy is flowing. So, if, so if, if if the energy is going from the squid to the sperm whale, the arrow points to the sperm whale. So you don't want to get that confused. You want to be able to understand. The base of the food web is typically producers. So we have producers down here as the base of the food web. And at the very top, we typically have uh, quaternary uh, consumers or top-level predators. Um, so be careful that you read your, your uh, food webs the right way. So energy always flows, uh, the arrow always points to where the energy is flowing, and we have producers that always are at the base of a food web. Now an energy pyramid is a little bit different than a food web. It shows basically where the bulk of energy exists. In this particular food uh, energy pyramid, you can see that huge amounts of, of sunlight strike the earth, but only very little of it is actually retained as uh, a stored chemical energy inside of plants. So here you can see the primary consumers have 10,000 joules of energy stored in them, whereas the first level uh, of the of first level consumers, the primary consumers only have 1,000 joules. And then if you move to the next level, you have 100 joules, and then you have 10 joules of uh, energy. So probably when you go to an ecosystem, the reason you see more plants is because there's just more available energy there because they're getting their energy from sunlight. Whereas if you look at the next level, you know, there's going to be more grasshoppers and then there's going to be more mice and very few snakes are found in an ecosystem. That's because there's not enough energy to support uh, that, that uh, a high number of snakes. Um, if you notice, 90% of all the energy is lost between feeding levels. So 90% is lost and only 10% is retained. The reason that uh, so little energy is retained uh, and so much is lost is because we lose a lot of, um, of the energy from trophic level to trophic level as heat. Also, species are very inefficient. You know, the, the, they, they, they can't digest 100% of the food. So they're using a lot of the food for energy. Um, and so 90% is lost between feeding levels. So by the time you get to the hawk, there's very little energy left to, uh, or available for it to feed on. Um, and so that's why we don't see a lot of hawks or bald eagles in a habitat. There's just not enough energy that makes it up through the, um, through the ecosystem. This again is just showing you a, a feeding level again. So I don't like this particular pyramid. I like more of the stack pyramid here and uh, because it shows um, a, a more proper relationship where you get 90% of the energy lost between feeding levels. Uh, just showing you a different uh, flow of energy. Here this uh, particular uh, food web is, uh, is including uh, decaying organisms and microorganisms and detritivores and fungi. And I, I like that. It, it just shows a, a, a better, um, true relationship. Now, if, uh, if humans uh, went all vegetarian, we could have a lot more people, if that's what the goal of life is, is just to have a lot of people. I'm not sure that's what my goal of life is, is to have more and more people. But if we did go vegetarian, we would have more energy for people to consume. So um, you can see that uh, this is the available energy of corn. If we, if we took and used more of the energy to feed people, we could have more people. But, you know, if we take and feed cows corn, you know, there's less available energy for people to actually eat. So in a world uh, in the future where you have 14 uh, billion people, you know, we're not going to be able to eat cows to have 14 billion people. There's going to be a lot of starving people. Now, I'm not saying that's what I want to do. Um, you know, I'm not opposed to, to eating meat, although I eat mainly chicken and fish uh, for health benefits. And also, my wife can't eat beef because she has a, a tick-borne uh, disease called alpha-gal. But, um, you know, uh, cows consume a lot of vegetation. They consume a lot of water. It takes a lot of uh, nutrients to, to make a cow. And uh, we just can't support 14 billion people eating cow meat. There wouldn't be enough resources to do that. So when you study different kinds of, uh, of habitats, we find that different habitats have different uh, 
uh, net productions. So the amount of uh, biomass uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, an ecosystem produces, if you subtract the amount that's respired, used as, as nutrients to, to, for the organisms to live and use the induced cellular respiration, that gives you net production. And if you look up here, estuaries, swamps, and tropical rainforests are very, very, very productive uh, places. They produce huge amounts of, uh, of, um, of biomass. Whereas extreme deserts and deserts and tundra, these produce very little uh, amounts of, um, of uh, biomass. Uh, probably you know why. I mean, it has to do with temperature and it has to do with, um, with the amount of producers in a, that are in an ecosystem. We're going to study biomes at a different lecture, so we'll talk about these different biomes in a different lecture. Um, I have to bring up when I do food webs, um, and, and food pyramids or energy pyramids, I had to bring up the concept of, um, of um, the um, biomagnification. So you know a food pyramid looks like this, although I like the stacked pyramid. But a bio, you know, when you look at bioaccumulation, it, it works this way. It has an inverted pyramid and works this way. And what I mean by that is if we, if we introduce the poison into the environment, it gets into all of the phytoplankton, and this is an aquatic example here. And uh, so lots and lots and lots of poisons introduced into a lot of phytoplankton, but very little of the poison is actually in the phytoplankton. In this example, we're using a chemical called DDT. It's an insecticide. Um, it's an organic uh, insecticide. Uh, it's very resistant to biodegradation in the environment. Notice that the DDT, when it gets into the phytoplankton, when phytoplankton eat the algae, the parts per million is concentrated. And then, of course, as small fish eat lots of phytoplankton, the amount of poison becomes more concentrated. It becomes more concentrated as you work up the food, uh, the food uh, web uh, to where you get to um, the birds eating the fish that have large concentrations of DDT in them. Um, this is a problem because, as you see, as you work up the food web, the concentration of poison gets more and more exaggerated as you get into the top-level predators. Okay, and so this is a problem. So when we introduce poisons into the environment, they will will concentrate in top-level predators, such as your osprey, bald eagles, uh, brown pelicans. Um, these 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 uh, species ha have great uh, problems with uh, with poisons we introduce into the environment. Um, so, um, so we introduce all kinds of, uh, of, of uh, things like heavy metals and uh, other kinds of, uh, of persistent uh, organic uh, pollutants. Okay, so something to think about. Now, if you eat large predatory fish, you know, the concentration of these chemicals will be very high in you. So I hope that you would want to be uh, an environmentalist because you like to eat clean food because it just makes sense that you would want to keep, keep the environment clean so you have clean food to eat. I love eating fish. I don't like eating poisons. So I like to have clean environment for that reason. Okay, so just uh, another concept uh, related to uh, what we've been talking about. Uh, in communities, communities do have different kinds of ecological, ecological succession. Primary ecological, ecological succession is where you get a transition of a lifeless area to a thriving community. So when we start with uh, basically rock and we move towards having a thriving community. So um, the world is always creating new volcanic islands and glaciers at this point in time are actually retreating. And what this leaves is exposed rock with no soil. So we get pioneer species. These are very hardy organisms that will be the first organisms to colonize a lifeless area. These typically include autotrophic bacteria, lichens, and moss. These are very hardy creatures. They have the ability to live in dry areas, uh, extreme ultraviolet light areas, very extreme conditions like very cold, very hot conditions. And uh, these will basically come to a rock, begin to erode the rock, and uh, when they die, their bodies become part of the soil in addition to the eroded rock. So if we, if we notice, uh, this is, uh, happens to be um, the progression or recession of a glacier in Glacier Bay. So in 1760s, the glacier existed all the way out to this particular area here. And if we look today, the, the glaciers are all the way back over here. So this is what a retreating great, uh, glacier leaves. It leaves exposed rock. 
And uh, unfortunately, this uh, picture doesn't look very, very, very good there, but there's actually um, bacteria and lichens and, and uh, moss that are growing all over this rock here. So they're beginning the, the uh, process of, of, uh, of uh, primary succession. Secondary succession is the reformation of a community after the disturbance destroys most of the organisms, but it leaves intact soil. So we can have fire, hurricanes, and of course human disturbance that leaves intact soil, but, uh, but uh, um, the species will grow back very quickly. So, uh, so in this particular example here, we have a forest fire, and then after a year or two, you can see that there's a thriving community. Forest fires aren't so bad. Forest fires, you know, give a chance for different species to live than just trees. So don't think of forest fires as being bad. I know they destroy property and human, um, you know, dwellings and things of this nature, but, uh, but they're not uh, bad things for living communities. They give a chance for the living community to, uh, to change and to, um, and to allow other species like all these flowers to uh, have their turn. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in a forest fire before. I have. It's a wild experience. Uh, you know, it produces, you know, its own weather patterns. It's loud. It's just violent. It's, it's just a, a crazy experience to experience. So do communities ever stop uh, evolving? Do they ever stop changing? Well, you know, some uh, models, uh, you know, such as the stability model, says that, uh, that uh, communities maintain, um, you know, uh, a, a constant uh, species. Once it gets to a certain age, it has a constant species despite disturbances. The non-equilibrium models say that communities are always uh, changing. Uh, I tend to think that the non-equilibrium model is probably the truest one because it seems to me that nature continually changes all the time um, um, because uh, the environment is changing all the time. All right, last little concept here is uh, biodiversity. What affects uh, communities and the diversity in communities? Seems like distance from the equator, the amount of available energy, and the amount of space uh, will uh, actually take and uh, increase biodiversity. The, the closer you get to the equator, the greater the biodiversity. The greater the amount of available energy, the greater the biodiversity, and of course the greater the space, the greater the biodiversity. Here's an example showing you bird species. So here, uh, you know, in Central America, we have the greatest bird species, and it's closer to the equator. As you get further away from the equator, we have uh, a diminishment of species. Um, this is showing you the amount of evapotranspiration, which is uh, equivalent to the amount of photosynthesis. And this is the uh, tree species, uh, um, uh, tree species richness. So where you have the the, the lowest level of photosynthesis because, um, you know, perhaps uh, the, the temperature or things like that, you have the lowest tree species where you have the greatest amount of, of photosynthesis going on or uh, evapotranspiration, uh, you're going to have a greater number of species. So where you have a greater number of tree species you, and, and plant species, you have a greater number of, uh, of vertebrate species. Lower numbers equal lower numbers. So in terms of area, the greater amount of area, this happens to be this particular uh, species, uh, number of species of birds. So the lower the land area, the lower the number of species of birds, the greater the area, the greater number of species. Probably because there's just more available food and more available niches. So um, when you study islands, um, and, and uh, so the larger the number of square um, miles of an island, the greater number of species. The smaller the island, the smaller number of species. Um, why this happens to be important, why I bring this particular diagram up for you to see, is that when we build things like national parks and state parks, we want to have huge state parks, not little bitty state parks, that in national parks. That way we can increase the number of species that live in an area. Now, one way to get around this is if you have a state park here or a national park here and a national park here or a state park there, we can build corridors that species can actually travel through or migrate through. And uh, in my part of the world, in Virginia, we're actually doing that, uh, you know, um, so in, in, um, in my little um, 
in my little place where I was born in Chesapeake, Virginia, we have the Great Dismal Swamp, and we have um, you, uh, we have uh, uh, Chesapeake Park, which is a nice large city park. And what the Nature Conservancy is trying to do is they're trying to build a corridor between these particular habitats, the Great Dismal Swamp and, and this nice protected area um, called Chesapeake Park or Northwest River Park. And so every time, uh, you know, a farmer sells land, they try to buy land and we're trying to build corridors so these species can migrate um, between um, these, these areas. And uh, in, in our next lecture, when we talk about biomes, uh, we're going to talk about the non-living environment and the living environment uh, interacting with each other to create ecosystems. But in these ecosystems, we also have nutrient cycling. It's really beyond you know, this particular class to go into that. But all the different things like carbon, phosphorus, nitrogen, water, oxygen, and other minerals and elements are going to be cycling through communities and through ecosystems. And uh, we'll touch briefly on that in our next, um, in our next lecture. Okay, well that completes community ecology. Our next lecture will uh, we'll be talking more about ecosystems and, and, uh, and biomes. And uh, so until next time, if you need me, email me. If you, uh, if, uh, make sure you keep up with your due dates. Make sure you keep up with your, with your, um, with your reading and with, uh, and with uh, watching lectures and doing everything you need to do to be a great student. So I will see you next time.